uh, Synopsis, they came out with uh, yet another great report. It's called Open Source Security and Risk Analysis. Uh, there are a lot of uh, findings in the report that we have been talking about you know, it's, 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 I think it's just a new iterations of the same kind of report. There's nothing new that we're learning from the point of view of so many vulnerabilities and all, all those other aspects. But I want to have your take on what is your analysis of this report and analysis. Uh, this year's report, as always, was, was fascinating. Uh, and I would highlight maybe two bookends of, of the report because it almost had contradictory data, if you will. On one hand, they talk a lot about uh, effectively out-of-date software in the open source world, where they said, you know, 82% of code bases uh, have code that is over four years out of date, uh, and 88% of the code of of the code uh, not only is it out of date, it hasn't even been touched in two years. So that's sort of one bookend of the challenge, where you have out-of-date software that is not being security maintained. And on the other bookend, they talk about the active projects uh, generating patches at a rate that nobody can keep up with. And so you have this sort of two-faced challenge of code that is both out of date and changing too fast. And as a software professional using open source, those two challenges create a lot of headaches in terms of how do you keep your system secure? You're right. This contract. Okay. When you mentioned that this out of date software, now I have a question regarding that. Is it that the the organization are running out of date software in the infrastructure, or the software itself, the upstream project, has not been updated? So because I, I, oftentimes we have seen that the projects are updated, but users do not keep their projects updated. If you look at, you know, Equifax was a good example. If you look at OpenStack where 70% you know, users are still running unsupported version of OpenStack. So can you explain which is that? Absolutely. Um, and this goes beyond, you know, just the material that was written in the report. But when you, when you look out into the real world, um, you know, at the time that a software project is written, whether it's a, a website, a mobile app, a cloud service, uh, a field device like an ATM machine or a medical device or what have you. Uh, you know, even at creation time, the developers of that product will have uh, constraints on them. You know, they might need to work with a third party, third party software or, or a particular device driver that is only supported on, say, an older version of Linux. Um, and so you start off with constraints on even what, what version and how, you know, up to date, if you will, can you be? And then as time goes by, you will have, um, further constraints. So if you look at, say, a lot of medical equipment or bank ATM machines, a lot of those are running Windows XP. And this is now software that's over 20 years old, but you know, if you have an ATM deployed all over the country, all over the world, you know, is it really cost effective for you to go, you know, physically out to that device, maybe change it out, upgrade the hardware, upgrade the software and all that stuff. It can be very, very expensive and oftentimes cost prohibitive. So there are a lot of good business reasons and sort of technological reasons why, um, why a, a, an organization or a company might be running out of date software. Because uh, it, it wasn't out of date. At, at some point in time, it was in date. Uh, but, but just as the reality of the business constraints uh, go on, it will age out and become and become out of date. If you look at a lot of in military use case, like submarines and all that, they, they just don't have the time to come and keep their machines updated. So they do run old, but they are protecting it in a way that just because they're running old doesn't mean it it, it will be secure. And there are a lot of other ways where you can keep your system secure. We'll talk about that later. Uh, that is that's why we are having this discussion. Uh, what 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 else uh, was the highlight of this report? Well, the highlight where I think were those were those bookends, right? You know, one the out of date software, but you know we haven't really discussed more in depth the other bookend of software that is changing very rapidly uh, because yeah. that creates just as much of a challenge. And if you, if you look at both of these, of these bookends, the fundamental issue is the same. It's that um, essentially systems are unpatched. 
And when you look at it from a cybersecurity perspective, you can really, you can split the attacks that cyber attackers are doing into, into two categories. One are the so-called true zero days, where the attacker um, knows, of, knows of a bug that does not have a patch available no matter what. Uh, and those are common, but, but they are in a sense, the more rare of the two. Um, but if, you know, that's sort of one category is the attacker can get you in, and there is no patch available. The more common case is where there is a patch available, but the defender has not deployed the patch for whatever reason. They couldn't do it quickly enough, or, you know, it was one of these cases where they have out of date software that's four years old. Uh, that patch is a blueprint for the attacker, right? We've done analysis over open source ourselves at Polyverse, and we found over a million unpatched bugs. So somewhere in those million unpatched bugs in, in the open source ecosystem are exploits that uh, are, are bugs that attackers can exploit. So that becomes your zero days. But if the attacker doesn't want to go through the effort of analyzing those bugs and figuring out which ones they can exploit, the patch is super helpful because the patch tells the attacker exactly, here's a bug that is ex that is deemed exploitable. Here's exactly where it is in the code. Here's exactly how it works. Uh, and it's basically the, the recipe. You know, it's the, it's the paint by numbers for an attacker to very easily create an attack. So there's a lot of danger in having unpatched systems because every patch that you miss is almost guaranteed an attack um, as an attack vector that the adversaries can easily exploit. Because again, we've told them via the patch exactly what to do. And so, uh, you know, those things become, become a big, big challenge for you, right? Because you have to, you have to stay on top of the patches, but you might not be able to. So what do you do? You don't make money by maintaining the application. You make money by making your application more useful to your users. So, 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 you know, moving fast, you know, it's it's not a kind of. It sounds like an utopia, but it is not. There are so many pieces that does, don't move at the same rate. So, uh, what are the ways there where while some pieces can move faster rate? And there are some pieces which are not moving at the fast rate and your developer should not lose their sleep at night, yet you ensure that your infrastructure, your workloads are safe. Uh, is there any magic bullet? Is there any, any you know, magic potion there? Uh, I think there is. And if I may, let me, let me suggest um, a different pivot to the taxonomy that you just described. Um, because there's, there's two things you brought up. One is business value and the second is speed of development. And uh, those things are almost, um, uh, they're orthogonal to each other in a sense, in that any individual company is gonna choose a speed that makes sense for them. If you're building out a website, that's probably something that you can, we, you can iterate on and experiment with and evolve very, very rapidly, often many times or even hundreds of times a day. Uh, if you are building a pacemaker, uh, a good dear friend of mine just went in for pacemaker surgery uh, this weekend. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I hope they tested that thing. They took their time, <laughs> were very thoughtful about it, very careful, because once that pacemaker goes in, uh, you know, that that's a pretty serious surgery, right? So there are other, you know, technologies that people work on where you need to have a have a slower, more thoughtful, uh, you know, development cycle uh, to achieve the value that you want for your customers, like a medical device. And so, uh, you know, there's one dimension which says, what is the speed? But in both cases, you're, you're, an you're answering this question of what is the business value? And outside of pure dedicated security companies like mine, very few people can say, oh, hey, I've created business value by by security. People want security. It's, it's kind of the, it's a, it's a necessary aspect. You don't want your system breached, but security by itself isn't adding any value to the, to the customer. 
Um, you want a secure pacemaker because you don't want somebody you know, hacking into pacemakers and killing a bunch of people. But by itself, security doesn't help the heart, right? You have to have the functionality of the pacemaker to, um, you know, to, to do that. And so, you know, or you have to have the functionality of the website to create the business value for your, for your company. And so, uh, the thing that you want to do then is say, how do you create cyber resilience in a way that's very cost effective and high, re- high business value for, for customers? And the way to create cost effective cyber resilience is to bake it in from the start. If you create designs that and systems that are intrinsically secure, uh, that is much better than creating systems where you've put on security as an afterthought. If you're doing it in a traditional reactive approach with a firewall or antivirus, where you constantly have to work on this thing and have somebody, you know, watching it 24 by seven, looking at all the alerts, trying to decide what's going on. Those are very expensive, reactive type approaches. And there are new technologies like moving target defense that let you do it proactively where the system is just resilient to begin with. And you don't have to spend that sort of operational cost over time, which takes away from your business value, which was exactly your point. Alex, thank you so much for taking your time out today and and talking about this report. And you also gave a lot of insights into that uh, the fact is that just because things are even e- either moving too fast or that your own infrastructure is too slow, you don't have to really worry about security because there are solutions, as you mentioned, you know, moving target defense that are there that can still help you in maintaining your own pace. You should not change the pace of your business just to be secure and safe. Uh, and I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Fatma. Appreciate it.